Right, so could you uh, put your hands together for one more time this evening for Ragu from Yelp? Uh, hello? Oh, hopefully, oh, hope you can hear me. Okay. <coughs> um, so good evening. Uh, today I'm going to talk, going to talk about uh, Cassandra in Docker at Yelp, opportunities and challenges. And uh, speaking of me, I'm Raghavendra, or Raghu for short, and that's my Twitter handle and whatnot. Uh, and yeah, uh, and, 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 I, and I see that uh, I'm between two beer breaks now, so hopefully I'm not holding you too long, you know, between, so I'm between one beer break and another one pub visit, so hopefully I'll keep it uh, sweet and short. Uh, I work in the database and reliability engineering uh, team at Yelp here in our London office, which is not that far from here. In fact, I walk from the office. Um, it's near Barbican. Anyway, <clears throat> cool. Um, uh, as always, all the slides start with the mission and all that, right? So this is our mission. So it's to connect people with great local businesses. You know, this is you, and that's the business. And so there's a there's a you know bidirectional arrow there, right? So. Uh, and some statistics, uh, you know, statistics are good, right? So as of uh, 31st March 2019, uh, we have about 184 million reviews in total and growing. Uh, about 35 million mobile app unique users. Yeah, mobile is the new thing, right? Who, who cares about HTTP and WW anymore? Uh, 69 million mobile web unique users and 63 million desktop unique visitors. This is just to give an example um, of a scale that we deal with. Cool. Okay. This is, uh, sorry, uh, seems like due to some reasons, uh, you know, we are sticking with the paper here rather than the slides. But again, you know, uh, we are an infrastructure team, you know, we have to be resilient, right? <laughs> cool. Uh, overview, great. Uh, so, yeah, what I'm going to talk about today, you know, uh, just so you know when the slides are ending, you know. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Cassandra, Cassandra at Yelp, uh, the history of Docker at Yelp. Not a long history, a short history, a brief history. Uh, opportunities in Dockerization that we have found for Cassandra. Uh, the challenges we have encountered, of course, you know, as they say, share your pains, right? Uh, or was it happiness? I don't know. Which, or both. <laughs> so I'm sharing both here. Uh, and finally, the conclusion. Uh, just be, uh, before I uh, uh, go to that, I just a uh, quick show of hands. You know, uh, how many here have a data store in production? Like any database, I guess, of course, right? Um, cool. Uh, now, uh, how many of those data stores are in cloud? Cloud being AWS, GCP, or Azure? Great. And uh, how many of that is AWS? Uh, just so that you know, I don't have to explain things. Oh, great. I guess I should have asked how many are not in AWS, probably, right? In cloud? Oh, yeah, cloud, but not AWS. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, this is like an advertisement for AWS then. Anyway. Uh, and finally, and finally, how many of you have data source, uh, cloud or non-cloud, but uh, in some way uh, connected to Docker? Oh, great! That's good. Yeah, cool. Uh, and and the uh, last question here is: uh, Is everyone happy with the status quo, or does anyone want to roll back and can't? Okay, I guess everyone can, or maybe they're stuck. I don't know. Uh, Okay, I guess, uh, cool. So I'm going to talk about Cassandra first. Uh, what is Cassandra? Cassandra is a distributed uh, wide column NoSQL data store, for those of us who don't know about that here. It's written in Java. Uh, it is multi-data center. Uh, this, is, this is quite good because there are many data stores which are, you know, which, which you, you can deploy over multiple data centers, but you know, which are not uh, that aware of uh, locality with respect to LAN versus WAN and geographic replication versus local replication and so on. Uh, it also offers tunable consistency, which is really good. So by default, it offers uh, AP, which is availability and partition tolerance in the presence of, uh, you know, in, in the cap uh, idea, uh, paradigm. So what that means is in, in presence of partitions, it chooses uh, uh, availability or consistency. So that's the default. But again, it offers tunable consistency, which means that clients can say, you know, I, I need uh, these, uh, my reads to come from all the replicas or none or a one, not none. Uh, one or all or quorum. So that's the tunable consistency. It's also right friendly, uh, right friendly in that uh, it uses a, a lock structure merge tree rather than a B tree. So it's very, it's heavily optimized for writes uh, uh, compared to like MySQL say, with the SignoDB, which is optimized for low latency reads, which has B tree. Also, it's cloud aware. So uh, it supports gossip. Uh, so uh, all the nodes uh, know about each other through uh, gossip protocol. Uh, it has like very good failure detection mechanism. Uh, 
and uh, it can you know like due to latency or or like uh, disconnections or network partitions and so on it also supports uh, something called a snitching which i'll not go in detail basically what that means is it knows uh, all the nodes know where they are with respect to the environment and uh, can can identify slow nodes so that queries don't go to them and it also has something called as handoff which means if a sibling node is down uh, the other node stores all its rights and when it comes back up it gives it back to them this is cool right awesome great um, uh, so the next is Cassandra at Yelp, right? So we use uh, Cassandra as both uh, for primary as well as derived data. Uh, what that means is uh, we use it also, we use it in both interactive as well as in batch fashion. So for both, both for batch as well as interactive queries. And uh, this is what is referred to as OLTP and OLAP in your database world, like online, online transaction processing and online analytical processing. So, uh, and of course we are on AWS, Yelp has been on AWS for a while. So uh, most of our Cassandra clusters are deployed on fifth generation EC2 instances, M5. Uh, we use a EBS for storage. And this is for a good reason, which I'll come, come to shortly. Uh, EBS provides a clear separation between stateful uh, as well as state and stateless systems. The stateful being the EBS and stateless being the compute. This is the instance. Uh, and we explored this really well. Uh, and we use uh, uh, custom node discovery for clients and Cassandra seeds uh, use with SmartStack. For those of us, uh, uh, who don't know what SmartStack is? SmartStack is an automated service discovery registration framework. So basically, to discover nodes and register uh, for nodes to register themselves and for other clients to discover these nodes. Um, and this this started at Airbnb, and uh, we have adopt, adopted it at Yelp uh, quite well. And uh, and finally, other things such as uh, for Cassandra, we have automated schema management. Um, you know, there's no ad hoc uh, uh, alter table or create table. Everything is in a repository, and it gets applied. Uh, and backups, we back up everything into S3. Uh, and we also manage our Cassandra clusters with Task Command. Task Command uh, is a distributed cluster task manager uh, that we have built at Yelp. Uh, it's built on Zookeeper and AWS SQS. Uh, I noticed that SQS was mentioned in Willem's talk. Uh, it's not for batch processing or anything. So this is just for like a, a, as a control plane, you know, rather than any any anything. So nothing heavy. Uh, great. So this is Yelp Cassandra at 10,000 feet, like very high. <laughs> so as you can see, I, I've drawn some. Uh, very rudimentary diagrams uh, uh, with uh, AWS icons. AWS is good with icons, by the way, now, at least now. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so as you can see, we have uh, all our clusters. Uh, uh, they're in order scaling group and they span availability zones uh, and we back up into S3 and they have M5 and these are corresponding EBSs. And uh, the versions we have deployed are both two and three. Uh, mo mostly it's two, but uh, new clusters we are deploying on Cassandra three. Uh, usage of Cassandra at Yelp mostly is, you know, for your regular um, data, but also for things like metrics uh, and in uh, uh, and also with Elasticsearch, as well as uh, for our uh, Zipkin pipeline. Right. Uh, great. Okay. So the next one is uh, Docker uh, and you know Yelp. What's the history of Docker at Yelp? So it started with something called as Pasta. Pasta is a uh, is a play on uh, a platform as a service at Yelp. This, uh, the TA doesn't stand for anything, you know. At Yelp, we have a tradition of naming some things after food, you know, because Yelp restaurant reviews, right? So, uh, Pasta is basically a highly, dis uh, highly available distributed system for building and deploying running services uh, on Mesos. Uh, and uh, and yeah, uh, we, we have a big team, so, and we are hiring. I'll come to that in the end. <laughs> so, uh, we have a few thousand microservices deployed and growing. I mean, we don't uh, uh, ask developers not to deploy anything, you know, whatever they want to deploy, they can deploy. Uh, even our website runs on this, and uh, the service, the main service behind the mobile app, runs behind, uh, uh, you know, runs on Pasta. So that that's uh, that's a good enough confidence, right? Uh, we have hundreds of deployments every day. So you know, all these microservices, thousands of microservices, you know, they churn every day, um, all automated and through Jenkins. Uh, even our testing framework runs on this. Uh, so why Pasta? There are multiple features that Pasta provides, but two main ones I would like to just mention is one is Clusterman. Clusterman is our uh, in-house signal-based autoscaler for diverse workloads. Basically, uh, this is how we autoscale both the instances, underlying EC2 instances, like getting uh, from, from uh, AWS how many underlying instances we need, and also uh, the, the containers themselves, uh, autoscaling the, container, uh, auto the containers for the services based on various signals such as CPU or uh, disk IO or whatnot. So that's, that's the main one. And the second one is uh, Spotfleet. Uh, I noticed Spotfleet uh, was mentioned in both, uh, both the talks, I believe. Um, you know, who doesn't want to save money, right? Uh, even the big companies want to. So it's not just startups. 
uh, and so every uh, we have deployed uh, we have very successfully deployed our uh, microservices uh, and and macro services on uh, spot fleet so spot fleets are what are spot fleets uh, so they contain time shared instances which can be revoked at any time you get like 2 minutes or something before they're re revoked and uh, we and uh, much like uh, you know, like your mutual funds, we have diversified this across multiple AZs and instance types for high availability. So, you know, so that if it, if Amazon thinks, you know, the price, the spot price needs to be high, it's not like our website will go empty, right? So, so we have diversified enough so that, you know, it's safe. Uh, we have, we have invested enough to make it completely safe. Uh, and finally, I guess there's no talk of, uh, you know, involving Docker, without, you know, Kubernetes, right? Uh, we have, we are, uh, look, uh, so well, these are so the the microservices are stateless for stateful services now we are exploring kubernetes um, and uh, and and i guess thinking uh, speaking of waterbeds i mean we have had like multiple waterbed incidents you know that's that's what infrastructure is right it's uh, it's going from one waterbed incident to another like uh, to channel winston churchill you know like to go from one failure to another anyway uh, so next next comes the opportunities that we are looking for uh, when we are talking of cassandra uh, on Docker at Yelp uh, with Kubernetes. So the first one is lifecycle management. You know, when life gives you uh, lemons, you need to write your own lifecycle management, right? <laughs> so AWS does provide lifecycle hooks uh, with SNS and whatnot, but that's not sufficient. Uh, often this means that we have to write abstractions around uh, things like uh, EBS, uh, because EBS, you know, it's physical, right? It cannot move between availability zones. Availability zones are data centers. Uh, so when, uh, when, when a new instance comes up in another one, sometimes you have to fall back to streaming the data rather than detaching, attaching EBS, which is how we do the lifecycle management. So basically, when an instance needs to die, uh, we detach the EBS from that, and uh, whichever the new instance comes up, we attach the EBS to that. So, you know, so that way, we uh, maintain a clear separation of uh, stateful and stateless service, uh, stateful and stateless, stateful being the EBS and stateless being the compute. Anyway, so coming back to the lifecycle management, uh, we have been uh, we have our own code base around all of this, and uh, we we feel that this is best handled by the underlying PaaS provider, which is Pasta. So managing data store with lifecycle management can lead to leaky abstraction. We we would uh, like uh, in our team, like the DRE team, we would prefer to manage the Cassandra and uh, its uh, its logic rather than the entire uh, lifecycle management itself around uh, the storage. And uh, this is where we feel uh, the Dockerization with of Cassandra uh, would help especially with the Kubernetes. Great, and the next one is safe deployment. Uh, who here has used Terraform? Just a show of hands. Okay, uh, who here has lost or know someone who has lost a cluster with Terraform? Okay, okay, uh, cool. So Terraform is very powerful, you know, uh, maybe like CloudFormation, uh, I'm, I'm not used CloudFormation. It's very powerful. I mean, I've noticed people uh, who use CloudFormation mention that they want to use Terraform. Good, you should use it. But again, much like you know, like assembly or C, it's since it's so powerful, it makes it very easy to shoot yourself in the foot as well, you know. Uh, and when you are doing like so many deployments, you don't want to you want to keep your feet right. So, uh, uh, so so uh, what this means is uh, at Yelp, like our team, we want to pro provide a lot more power to the developers uh, to to make Cassandra self serve, so they can launch the clusters anytime they want, scale it up and down, destroy it, whatever, you know. Uh, so, uh, and we want to, uh, we want to be there between them and Terraform, you know, we don't want them to Terraform and all that. Uh, so the, to compare and contrast with the past uh, for the microservices that, you know, stateless microservices, developers currently have like a fire and forget kind of pattern. So, you know, they just deploy and then, you know, they just chill, uh, and while, you know, it's bouncing and it's getting deployed. Uh, and the reason why they chill so much because Pasta provides certain guarantees that, um, such as canarying and automated rollbacks and things like that. So. We want to have similar guarantees uh, with uh, uh, stateful services such as Cassandra on uh, uh, with Docker. Uh, so uh, that that that's 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 going to be quite useful for us. Okay. Uh, maintenance, right? Uh, I guess uh, nobody wants to restart all Cassandra clusters, right? Or uh, I don't know, upgrade them. Uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, if somebody is given a work like that, they go to Glassdoor probably <laughs> or LinkedIn, you know. Uh, so we want to reduce toil, you know. Uh, the Google uh, SRE book, uh, which, uh, which I recommend, highly recommend everyone to read, uh, re uh, rec defines toil as any work which is manual, repetitive, automate, automatable and tactical. So, uh, and it is something which is O of N with service growth. Basically, it means, you know, anything which is, uh, you know, like restart, uh, like, restarting all the Cassandra clusters in your uh, stack or something. So uh, for, for, for these reasons, uh, uh, the toil is bad, right? You know, because it slows progress. 
and it uh, causes uh, grumpy engineers, right? So uh, from that perspective, we have uh, felt that uh, moving from the EC2, building a layer of ex abstraction on top of EC2 with our El Pasta plus uh, Docker for Cassandra helps uh, uh, in, in you know, managing our Cassandra clusters uh, in the pattern which is popular in distributed systems terminology, which is called as cattle than pets, you know? What I mean. Uh, so you you just uh, you just mentioned how many you need and what type of storage you need and you know you just boom the cluster is there and, uh, and so on. So that's that's uh, the uh, maintenance part. Next is auto scaling. You know, auto scaling is the most exciting thing uh, which comes to my mind whenever I think of you know deploying uh, some data store. Uh, but it's not easy. Uh, uh, Yelp, much like m many other sites, has a cyclical load pattern. What this means is uh, we don't want to burn. AWS cycles. We don't want to make Jeff Bezos richer, uh, you know, when there is no traffic, right? Uh, right. So now, now uh, auto scaling helps us in this case. Uh, the cluster man that I was referring to earlier uh, helps us. So it what cluster man essentially is it relies on signals such as CPU usage, memory pressure, disk queue length, and with this we can scale our AWS spot fleet. Uh, I'll mention spot fleet in the next slide, but spot fleet is what we use for uh, for this. And uh, we also uh, rely on horizontal scaling for, uh, but this is more from a capacity planning perspective because scaling uh, data stores such as Cassandra involves a lot of data being, uh, there's a lot of data churn, especially for uh, our size. So uh, the horizontal, uh, we, we approach horizontal scaling uh, from a more of a, lo a long-term perspective, whereas for a short bursty workloads, we rely on vertical scaling, which is more on the CPU and memory side. And uh, this is where, again, the dockerization uh, of Cassandra has helped us uh, with uh, tuning the accurate amount of uh, CPUs and memory that we would need. Okay, great. Uh, next one is cost. Show me the money, right? <laughs> so spot fleets. Uh, we use uh, spot fleets with our microservices and we are uh, testing out uh, Cassandra for spot fleet. Uh, and this is uh, more uh, mainly for, uh, well, to start with, this is mainly for non-prod environments, you know. Because most of these environments are not used, let's say, during the weekend. So there's no point in uh, just running EC2 for them uh, if we can just uh, have them on spot fleet. And uh, uh, spot fleet requires instances which can be terminated really fast. You know, you get two minute guarantee and the instance goes away, right? So with the separation of state and compute, that like we have done with EC2 and uh, uh, EBS, uh, you know, uh, we can deploy Cassandra for that particular reason because we have separated the state into EBS and the we have made the compute completely stateless. And uh, this has helped us save us a lot of, a lot of cost with our regular microservices, ab about 50%. 50% is good, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so the next one is the security. Well, there is no discussion about uh, anything, I guess, without security, right? Uh, so uh, the dockerization of Cassandra has also uh, helped us look at uh, Cassandra or any data store from a perspective of security in that we're looking at things like uh, isolating IAMs, per container. So IAMs are basically identity and access management that AWS provides, which based on the show of hands, I guess everyone knows, uh, but they're quite uh, hard to understand as well, at least for me. <laughs> and they, I noticed on the IAM side, they have a video uh, which says, can you become an IAM ninja? I don't know why it says that. Uh, so we are looking at per container IAMs. Uh, we are also uh, effectively leveraging Linux capabilities so that we are not running anything as root but instead providing only very fine grained capabilities uh, to the processes. Uh, we run uh, Cassandra, of course, as an unprivileged user. So that's very uh, important as well. Uh, and the final thing is, uh, uh, we are in the opportunity side is, we want to keep our infrastructure agile. Uh, just to give an example with EC2 or like with regular data stores, how it works is if, you, if there is a vulnerability, right? Uh, you get a ticket and uh, you see what version to upgrade, then you, you know, bump the version in Puppet and then, by the way, Yelp uses Puppet. So, uh, we bump the version puppet and then you roll your cluster and go to every cluster and blah, 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 right? Whereas if, you, uh, if your data store uh, is uh, introduced into your uh, continuous integration world, you just bump it and uh, then you deploy it. And if it breaks, uh, you know, you do not uh, uh, proceed uh, with the other clusters, you know? So you just canary it first and then if that's fine, then you go with others. And if it is not working fine, then you can probably roll back easily. So that's, that's the kind of agility uh, and uh, the cattle uh, than pets kind of uh, culture that we want to bring here again to the data stores. And uh, this, uh, this also means that we can do like automated rollbacks as I just mentioned. Great, so now we have completed the opportunities. Now comes the challenges, you know. You saw the roses, now the thorns, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm always a half uh, cup uh, full kind of guy. So that's why I started with opportunities. Now the half cup empty bit. 
uh, cool. So these challenges are things which are uh, which upend our assumptions and literally sweep us off our feet, like you know this cow. Um, cool. Uh, so so what are the challenges? I mean, these challenges are not uh, uh, innate uh, challenges that everyone may face, but these are the challenges we are facing when transitioning from EC2 to uh, Cassandra, the EC2 to Dockerized Cassandra. So the first one is noisy neighbor. I guess everyone uh, uh, may have encountered this at some point or another when, when they're de deploying your containers and you know, uh, there's like one container where you're just doing, I don't know, some Python web service and someone else runs uh, like a DD <laughs> command, right? In their container and it completely blocks your container. So, so we, have, uh, we, we have examined this and uh, there are multiple ways we are you know, uh, looking at fixing this, things such as uh, by using EBS instead of instant storage, we do not have to uh, think of uh, using C groups for you know, IOS, IOPS uh, and uh, because EBS is completely isolated, right? And we're also using EBS optimized instances, which uh, means in AWS terms, that the network traffic for your uh, instance does not compete with the storage traffic for your instance. So we are using that. Uh, we also noticed that uh, the page cache, even though uh, there are C groups for that, uh, is kind of shared between the containers, right? So that can cause issues. So that's something we are exploring now. Uh, but, but the main bit here is uh, the storage is what has been uh, uh, of main concern to us. And uh, that's somehow we have, uh, uh, we have used EBS there to alleviate the major issues. And finally, uh, uh, our approach is that if, uh, you know, if your neighbor is noisy, uh, either you leave or you kick them out, right? So, uh, well, in real world, uh, I don't know. But, but here, what we do is we ensure that IO heavy processes are not packed on the same node. So, you know, you have like one Cassandra running and probably other one is not IO bound, which is, I don't know, maybe some uh, web service or something like that, which probably talks to Cassandra. You know, that would be great, right? Uh, or uh, that, that, that is uh, one thing. Or the other one is where you evict a container which slows others. So assume there is a bad container, a bad neighbor, you just evict them and send them to another node, right? Great. Uh, the next one is cold cache. Uh, this, the Cassandra, unlike say inodb and more like PostgreSQL, relies heavily on page cache. You know, uh, inodb and MySQL has like buff buffer pool and whatnot, whereas uh, Cassandra relies on your uh, operating system page cache. So storage is portable with EBS, but memory is not, right? You know, you cannot transfer memory. Uh, There's no RDMA. We are not at least using any RDMA here. So what that what this means is, while on EC2 world, you can just restart your Cassandra process and page cache remains on the same node. If you with containers, when you you know bounce your container, or what I mean by that is you know you restart your container, it may end up on a different node. So you know there's no page cache uh, maintained. So what this means is if you restart your entire cluster, or uh, the cluster may end up being completely cold, and uh, you know the performance will completely drop, right? When you're let's say uh, deploying a new package. Uh, for this, we have explored solutions such as, uh, similar to dumping uh, the page cache for Cassandra to EBS, and then you know it, when it comes up in the new instance, you load from uh, you load the a uh, dumped page cache from from that EBS, and you know your cluster is warm again. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how it goes. You know, uh, great. So the next, the uh, oh right. So uh, Cassandra, as I mentioned, some a few slides back runs on Java. So well, Java, uh, you know, you know, I, I was thinking of the Jeff uh, Goldblum's code. You know, life uh, finds a way, right? <laughs> uh, you know, as he says in Jurassic Park. Uh, I was, saying, I was just thinking of that uh, earlier. So with Java, we have had, uh, uh, I mean, so Java is not, uh, was not container friendly till recently. Uh, Java 10 uh, and above has become, it has good Docker support. Unfortunately, Cassandra 3 only supports till Java 8. Oh, right. Cassandra 4 supports Java 11, but Cassandra 4 is not a GA and you know, we don't want to beat a test. And now, uh, the, the, this was the case till recently, but now uh, Java 8, uh, the very recent Java 8, the one with the, the change license has a lot of Docker support. Uh, but again, that's a challenge, but uh, you know, fortunately there are, there's not just open, you know, Oracle JDK now, there are like others like Cordato and Zool and all that, so we can use those. Uh, Cordato is AWS's JDK. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, th this was impacting us in terms of like CPU and memory limits, which can impact like GC and heap management and et cetera, et cetera, and causing, uh, you know, uh, out of memory errors, right? So nobody wants that. So uh, we, we, we approached this by, you know, of course, upgrading the Java to like the latest one. Thankfully, they added, they fixed it. Uh, but for some reason, after the license change, I don't know. Uh, cool. So the Java runtime uh, posed an issue, but uh, for now, uh, you know, the upgrading has worked there uh, for, for, to the latest uh, minor version under eight. But once Cassandra 4 is released, you know, we can uh, test with Java 
11 or so. And uh, configuration management, as I said, Yelp runs on Puppet. Uh, Puppet is good for, you know, your easy to world for deploying packages, config files, cron jobs, monitoring checks, whatever you want. <laughs> and it will do it for you. But uh, when it comes to dockerizing, you need to, you need to think on how you, how you can deploy the same thing in your Docker, uh, uh, in your Docker file, whether you, should, you want to package it and put it inside Docker or whether you want to put it on host or mount it. So the, we are figuring this out, but, uh, uh, but you know, this is a challenge. So we need to figure out like, how to do this in, a, in an elegant and, and more importantly, in a sustainable way. Observability. <laughs> Observability require, deserves its own talk, right? Uh, you know, if you go to Twitter and search for observability, you'll find a lot of hits. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the, just going by the Zen proverb, if you have deployed something and it's not observed, does it really exist? I guess not, right? Uh, so we, we use uh, Sensu at uh, Yelp with uh, Yelp's Puppet monitoring checks. So that's how we uh, deploy our Sensu checks. They're not in a package, they're deployed to Puppet. And uh, even our cron jobs have stainless checks and whatnot, so that if your cron job is failing, you know, we know. Now we need to look at how we can best uh, package this and how well we can invoke this. And again, uh, it's a choice between uh, putting it into the Docker file versus mounting them from the host. For the metrics, however, what we have done is we have deployed our collectors on the host and these uh, talk to Cassandra JMX and collect the metrics and send it to signal effects. Uh, for the metrics, it has been a bit more simpler than on the, uh, on the monitoring side. Uh, great, so this uh, brings me to the conclusion. I guess, uh, I mean, just to summarize, uh, we started with like uh, Yelp's uh, microservices on Pasta, and then we decided uh, to experiment and uh, to and you know develop uh, uh, Cassandra with Docker plus Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, th there are a lot of these opportunities that we have been able to exploit, such as Clusterman and uh, Spotfleet. You know, at the same time, there have been some challenges, uh, and so many of these challenges we have been able to uh, you know solve to to an extent, and many of them we are still solving. By the way, we are hiring. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, great. Uh, oh, right, that's the next slide. Uh, so what I wanted to say here is that uh, if you want to know more about these things, uh, you can ask me after this talk, but if you really want to know like in deep, well, there's no other way than to get hired by us, right? So we are hiring uh, and yeah, there are a lot of happy faces there and you can be one. Uh, anyway, so these are some of the related talks uh, that I put, uh, you know, pertaining to whatever I mentioned. Uh, and yeah, so this is uh, the best part of the uh, meetup, I believe, uh, because uh, I also have swag for, you know, people who ask questions. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, so I brought a bag like Santa Claus, you know, uh, like I'm like the Santa Claus of swag now. Cool. So you can ask me questions, and you know uh, I can give you some swag. And the best part is so. <laughs> Just so you're aware, I was at the microservices meetup the other day, and the question "Can I have some?" doesn't apply. It has to be a good question. Uh, this is this is making your life a little bit harder, but. <laughs> uh, but in a way, uh, you know how uh, in the way they say uh, in the flower market, uh, I have bought a lot of things, and I don't want to carry it back. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, so, so everything goes. Um, so feel free to ask me <laughs> questions. Loads of questions. Okay, just so um, so I don't want to overrun that much. So please, can we? Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. All right, cool. Um, who has not asked a question tonight yet? Right. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. Uh. This is. Um, yeah, right. It also has a tracker, so we can come and hire you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a few slides back that you're running thousands of microservices. Right. Is that uh, instances of or completely different microservices, thousands of them? So, uh, okay. So the question is uh, whether those are instances or microservices. So, so each... Uh, microservices is either a marathon job or, uh, or a chronos job, you know, in Mesos world. So marathon job is essentially uh, where you say like, I want to run this uh, hello world, let's say just to give an example, a Python web server with X, X instances. So your container will run on that many instances. So does that, does that help? So it depends on like each microservice may be as big as like our, you know, like a website with like thousands of instances, uh, you know, the, which means 
that many containers or it may be just like you know three instances and you know that many containers and yeah yeah, yeah that's, i think that's fine what i was wondering at first i thought maybe you're running thousands of long running microservices right uh, most of them are long long running completely different tests uh, so right right so that so it's, i'm not counting the number of instances so that's uh, the each itself is a lot you know if, if that makes sense wow <laughs> I mean, because uh, we have not restricted any of our developers. So like we have hackathons every quarter and, you know, people like to hack, right? So just write microservices. So uh, uh, the, the talks that I mentioned in the links have uh, uh, some disc description about like Yelp Pasta, which is basically everything is declarative with that. So you just put, there's a repository. You just put some file in that, which says how many instances you want, uh, like uh, how many instances and what your name of your microservice is and what container you, you know, you're running. And that's it. It just comes up. And, uh, and you know, uh, and we are not stopping anyone from capa uh, due to capacity reasons or anything. So, because it's pot fleet, right? So, I think you should give him something now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you know, this wire is kind of tethering me. You just throw it. Oh, we're all about the so, delivery, right? Uh, regarding throwing, uh, <laughs> we have had instances where you know we threw you something, and you know there are a lot of people, right? It can hit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but for you, I can throw you for, for throw probably. Yeah, this I, I also have like balls and stuff. So, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. sure. Um, last question. Um, so I've seen that you are using Kubernetes, uh, and it's kind of strange because you are using only for the worst features, which is set for sets. Um, do you like pain, or did you try to figure out a better solution for this one? Because uh, sorry, uh, just uh, so if I understand, uh, your question is why we are looking at only stateful and not stateless. Is that what you mean? Uh, basically, in Kubernetes. Okay, so the history goes like this: uh, we started with Mesos, and you know there was no Kubernetes, uh, and Mesos has been there for a long time. You know, uh, strong, stable, all that. Uh, but uh, but what we noticed is for for stateful workloads, you know, we could not, uh, at least we could not run it with uh, with uh, uh, Mesos. So that's the reason why we looked at Kubernetes. However, uh, that does not mean uh, we want to maintain both of them, right? So uh, at some point, we'll be deciding on one of them and, uh, you know, moving in that direction. No, hey, hey, yo, hey. Yeah. Uh, you know, life happens, <laughs> you know. A very, very, very quick question. How many of your developers have tried to run a Bitcoin miner? Um, well, I certainly didn't. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, we uh, didn't, but someone did. We do have a GPU support in Pasta as well. So, you know, for machine learning, you know, machine learning. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it is expensive, but, you know, we want to learn, right? Uh, from data. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, D did you get so the bag as well? We had we had a lovely assistant. I, I mean, I'm happy to run it. Uh, so, any other? I've just got a question about Puppet and your use of Terraform. So sure. you said that you use Terraform for well, I guess provisioning instances. Yes, correct. Um, how automated is that process? So, for example, uh, your developers are they the people that run Terraform, or is Puppet somehow hooked into Terraform? to sort of have an automated provisioning of an instance on AWS that allows you to sort of give your developer access to a VM. What, how, you know, what, what sort of aspect do you run Terraform in? Sure. So uh, for this, like the pasta, stateless microservices, developers never, not, don't even come close to the Terraform. However, for the, like for the data stores on EC2, uh, it has been the case that either developers, like in some teams or us, the infrastructure engineers had to, you know, run make plan and make apply and all that uh, to provision the uh, things. Uh, and regarding Puppet, so the way we have is what is called as the external node classifier. So basically what we do is we tag uh, the Terraform instances with the role and uh, the Puppet uh, uh, knows what role to, uh, to run on that, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so you, sorry, so your, conf your configuration management tool is able to identify what VM it's deploying to or configuring Sure. Depending on what you've tagged, and that's yes. done through Terraform. Correct. Okay. Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> um, did you get the? I did not. Okay.
Do, do, I, do I also get one for the for the oh, strong let's see. question? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, I didn't mean that. You know, <laughs> physics, right? <laughs> um, cool. Uh, I have one bag left, uh, but I have other stuff. <laughs> yeah, but okay. At, what are the, oh, apparently my watch says I've done 10,000 steps today. Very useful information. What else do you uh, have to give away? <laughs> um, I will uh, just leave this here after the talk. And are you coming to the pub? No. Uh, yeah. He's coming there. <laughs> hey, this is, is it, this is the community speaking, okay? Oh, yeah, sure then. You can, you can come for one drink, right? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hey. You know, as they say in... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm very convinced. Distributor systems, at least once, right? <laughs> cool. All right. I think on that bombshell, we should uh, try to wrap it up because sure. uh, otherwise, uh, the funding circle folk will uh, probably also want to clean up and go home. <laughs> yeah. yeah sure. Go, or go to the pub. Sorry, obviously. Um, cool. I want to thank everybody who said that, that you you did a great job. You did a great job. You did a great job. It was all very funny and very. <laughs>